let me invite you. Through 16, I give you what I believe is the clearest description in the Bible of defining, given a conception of temptation, what it is. And being so clear and bold as James is, it helps us to realize what it's not. James chapter 1, beginning at verse number 14. You found your place. Would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word? The Bible says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when he is conceived to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Father, thank you for your word. Amen. You may be seated. The Bible and God. Decreases. No wonder Otto gave us that great one line and unguarded strength. When the Bible speaks of temptation, it's interesting to know a little bit about the word. The word temptation and trial is a word that's interchangeable in the Bible. When you read the word temptation, the word itself simply carries no negative connotation at all. It's a word meaning to simply test or prove. Now, whether it becomes a proof of righteousness or an inducement to evil depends on our response. When a trial or temptation comes our way, if we Our human experiences, usual or typical. Here's a good statement. Temptations are never unique experiences to us. And you'll go wrong in your heart and in your mind and the way you deal with temptation when you think that there's something out there that is unique to you and you alone. We can not already been experienced by temptation differ but basic temptation does not now with that in mind I'm going to pick up with verse number 14 and in verses 14 and 15 I want to walk through just two statements concerning temptation first of all I want to deal with the conception of temptation in your Bibles it says but each is tempted the statement is emphatic reminds us that no one temptation. The tense of tempted suggests a constant temptation continually being tempted. It just reminds us that there never comes a time in life where you get a free pass from the very days of just early childhood through the very life that seems to be a battle for our soul. And it comes in the form of a solicitation to evil. Now, in talking about the conception of temptation, he gives us three steps that the enemy uses in this passage to really solicit us to do that which is wrong. Let, let me call your attention to the words. The first step, we are drawn, it could be translated carried away. It really is such a strong word, it means dragging away so as if compelled by an inner desire. It's often used as a hunting term to refer to a baited trap designed to lure an unexpected or animal into it. 
The ancient Greeks used these words to describe the drawing of a fish from its original retreat so that it would succumb. To and so when the temptation passes by, we are drawn away from the things which keep us safe. And the Bible says that no one... And so there's going to be temptation. Aren't you grateful to God that there's a... So oftentimes we feel like, man, we have just been... Whether it's the world, the flesh, or the devil that has just come against us and we feel we've been in a fierce battle all week. And to God... It's one thing to be tempted. It's another thing to succumb to that temptation and find yourself indeed involved in evil. So the first thing is you're drawn away. We're drawn away. So we all know, especially when you come to the right relationship with God, God the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You want to live He's the one who's changed your life. And now there's these solicitations to evil that come our way if we succumb to them. And oftentimes we find personal propensity to sin and particular lust for particular things in our life we find them drawing us away sometimes it's sex sometimes it's power some and we would try to categorize them as one not being as evil as the other but the bottom line is sweet friends if something is used to draw you away from who God would have you to be it's not good period but then there's a second word. The second word is the word desire. Clearly, he says, each one of us is tempted, it's emphatic, when he is drawn away by his own desires. Or it can translate by his own lust. Drawn away from a straight course towards something for which he craves. Temptation to evil has its roots within man's evil heart bottom line is uh, if there was no propensity to sin within the context the way but that's not the case we are sinners and i know this we will not be perfect until we get on so spoke of this in mark chapter 7 and 21 listen to what christ said Seed, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blaspheme, pride, foolishness, sin, and defile. Attraction of sin were it not for man's sinful lust, which may be more appealing than the things of God. So we can't his demons, ungodly people, or the world in general. Our own heart. So the, the fault is entirely within us, in our unredeemed flesh. Jeremiah put it this way in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is and desperately wicked who can know it. Testament, the Apostle Paul uh, ran a commentary on this is in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 17, he said, For I know that that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, that is to, to do what's right, but to perform what is good. For the good that I will to do, I do not, but the evil I will not to do. I practice now if I do what I will not to do it is no longer I who do it but the sin that dwells in me I want you to hear that verse again Sin. now say it with me it dwells where within me call it whatever you want to call it the flesh call it the old nature but one thing you can't get away from it's sin in the life of the believer that still dwells there until the Lord Jesus Christ redeems humanness in its entirety when the body, soul, and spirit before one day will be fully, totally 
justified and glorified. So now if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the death? And then Paul says, God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, the law of sin this statement when I was writing this message I wrote truth to be known and here's what I wrote while we're all vulnerable to sins scripture forbids each person has his or her own set of special desires and lust you ever heard this statement before Satan waste no could actually uh, use darts against a child and not waste any of them is to know where to hit them. And see, each of us have our own particular set of behavior which is powerful solicitation to one person may have less appeal to another. That's why we can become judgmental in the family of God. We can say, did you hear what they did? In the name of Jesus, what were they thinking? I would never do that. But before you finish that sentence, make sure you don't use a period and for Christ's sake, don't use an explanation mark. To the contrary, use a comma and go on to say, but I do struggle in this area. Our commonality is not in the particular lust, but in the fact that we all have them. No personal responsibility. The one person a drink looks at the alcoholic and says my stars how can anyone let something so uh, ridiculous ruin their marriage their life their relationship with their children it's always easier like the elder brother to judge the sin in the life of the person so the bible uses the first word he says they're drawn away and he says they're drawn away when their desire and then what i've tried to say, that is plural uh, it is lust. It, it's different from one person to another. What it is that drives us away. And then he gives us the third word. And remember, this is a conception. And the third word is the word deceived. The Bible says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. And he uses the word enticed. Th this is interesting. You know where this word's used in the Bible? Are y'all listening real careful? We're just studying for a short time tonight. This, this word's used somewhere else in your Bible. This word enticed. You know where it's used? It's used to refer to false teachers that will teach something contrary to the word of God. In the prosperity gospel is so popular. It is the false teaching. It tries to lure you away. Why? Because we have within us this propensity that if a preacher teaches that we can all be and wise we want to buy in listen to second peter chapter 2 and verse 14 adultery and not cease from sin enticing there it is enticing who unstable souls they have a heart trained in covetous practices and are cursed children and they've drawn it by you able to draw you out but then there's another person that happens to be a propensity to sin. They're willing to believe this in order to just say, man, I, I'm willing to just buy into anything. I want to be part of the faith movement so I can just speak it and it be true. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. And when they speak, listen to this of the false teachers, speak great swelling words of emptiness. They allure, there it is, they allure through the lust of the flesh. There would be no allurement uh, through their lures uh, through their baits uh, you couldn't be seduced but it's just of the flesh you're desiring what they're peddling who live in
to traps and hooks because the bait is too attractive for them to resist. So it looks good, it smells good, appealing to their senses. And their desire for the bait is so intense that it causes them to and to overlook until it is too late. Listen to these statements. James, well, Satan is busy tempting believers to sin, but he also knew that the root of the problem is his own evil. One of those books you find yourself with either yellow marker or mark statements at the back of the book so you'll know where to find these great statements. Bonhoeffer. In this is one of the strongest statements that I could draw from his book. Listen to this. With irresistible power, desire ceases mastery over the flesh. It makes no difference whether it is sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power or greed for money. Joy in God is extinguished in us and we seek all our joy in the creature. At this moment, God is all reality. Desire for the creature is real. Satan does not here fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. The lust thus aroused envelops the mind and the will of man in deepest darkness. The powers of clear discrimination and of decisions are taken from us. So you can't hear from God anymore because of the filth, the sin that you've allowed into your life. So you can't have clear discretion because you can't get your wisdom from the Heavenly Father. So the powers of clear discrimination and of decisions are taken from us. The questions present themselves. Is what the flesh desires really sin in this case? Is what the flesh desires really sin in this case? Is it really not permitted to me, yes, expected of me now, here in my particular situation, to appease Everything within me rises up against the Word of God. And I'll tell you, if you don't know where you'll find language to support that, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and t- verses 12 and following, as you read the story of David, when Nathan came and told him he had been such an affront to the Word of God. So what, what do we have here? Three steps. It's a conception of... Be deceived. Now, let me give you one last statement and spend just a few minutes and I'll be through early. Let me talk to you about the consummation of temptation. Where where does temptation uh, desire to take someone? If indeed it's a solicitation to evil. I mean, isn't the only reason that parents the word of God and their uh, children and their teenagers about what they should not do. Isn't it just because they're joy killers? They just want to keep you really from what's good. That's what it is. They, they just want to rob you of joy so your life can be as miserable as theirs. Then you can even go around and say, man, have you ever been down to the church where they preach the Bible? I mean, nobody's smiling. Nobody's got joy. They just make us look like a bunch of hum- hum- But what is the consummation of temptation? I wonder how many people are in hell tonight that bought into sin that their family pleaded with them to stay away from, pleaded with Jesus Christ, and little did they know actually deceive them, they would embrace us, carry them down a road. Where Solomon, the, the wise writer, would write, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end is death. And destruction. I wonder how many are in hell tonight that had never intended to allow sin to take them there. I wonder how many tonight are in bondage to sin that in, never dreamed in a million years that this, what they thought was just simple temptation, a solicitation to evil in their heart, would carry them this far. The, the quartet had it right. Sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay. 
and keep you longer than you so, Verse 15 and 16, and we'll wrap it up. Then, when disciples... to the foot of the cross. How many of you know that? And bow there and say, God, in Jesus' name, I can't, but you can. Uh, I am weak, but you are strong. Lord, overcome me. How many know you can pray like the psalmist prayed in Psalms 119 and verse 35 when he said, make me to walk in thy ways. I delight to walk in your way. Why would the psalmist ask God to make him to do what he delights to do in? Because he realized that even though he had a desire to do it, he lacked the power to obey God. And so he needed the Lord to empower him, to carry him along. Grace is the ability to obey. It's the power that God instills within us to help us to be more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. So in verse number 15, the Bible says, then that's a strong word then. Then, what happened? Well, then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin. Listen to this language. When it's full grown, brings forth death. And then he gives this warning. Do not be deceived. Who's he referring to? Look at your Bibles. Who's he referring to? My beloved brethren. Don't be deceived. I, I deeply love you. He uses the strongest find in the Greek New Testament. Love you as a family. Don't be. Step that leads to the final step. So he says, what happened then? What happened then? What happened then? And there it is. Well, then, sin, conceived. This is when plans start to be made to fulfill the emotional desire that we have rationalized and justified in our minds. And this stage involves our will. Our conscious decision to pursue the lust until it is satisfied. It is now that we have made a choice. Lust. That's God showing us. This is the design he uses. You know, in your Bible, the Bible says, be not ignorant of Satan's devices. Now, I would say don't be ignorant of his designs either. Now, let me give you the second word. You move from this design and it leads to disobedience. Now, it says, gives birth to sin. So if we allow the process to continue, the design inevitably brings disobedience, which is sin. It gives birth as a mother, births a baby. So being tempted, I say it again, thanks be unto God, is not a sin. When you are solicited by evil, and even it may work against the propensity of sin in your own life where there's really uh, something about you that is curious, you want to go further down that road, but you know better as a child of God, it's a prohibition, and you know not to go there, that it only brings misery and, and death ultimately. So if, if it is only when the desire of humanity meets and embraces the forbidden thing that an un, oh, this is good, an unholy marriage takes place, between the two, and they all name is disobedience. Third word, and when desire has conceived, disobedience. It gives birth to sin, death. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. If, if there's a person in this room repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, you say, well, I'm as much alive as anybody in the world. But because you've never yes, you will die, but you won't just die one death. The Bible says, blessed is he who does not partake in the second death. What do you mean second death? It's one thing to die a physical death. It's another thing to die so spiritually that you're eternally separated from God. We don't hear much about it today. That's what it means to go to hell. When a person dies, they spend a Christless eternity. Uh, they will spend an eternity away from God. There's another way to say it. They spend eternity in hell. Verse 16, when he against the consequence of sin. So here, here's the truth. Anything you're flirting with, steps, 
may, may feel pretty, pretty, pretty good about it. I, I would only feel comfortable if none of those steps were a reality in my life. That I was not going in the direction of a desire that was a solicitation to evil in my life. Uh, realizing I could be deceived and fall in and give in to that particular. And then it would lead to disobedience and death. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, the way you warn us, in a land where there's millions of fishermen, millions of hunters, and almost every family on the planet knows something <laughs> or a deal about childbirth. You took it and put it in simple language so we'd not miss it and give us an opportunity to understand it in common language. Lord, I pray for anyone that may be lost without Christ on their way to a devil's hell. I pray the Spirit of God would arrest them for what Jesus did on the cross. And then, Lord, for the Christian, that brother, that beloved sister that's headed down the wrong road, giving in to propensity of the flesh instead of following and being committed to their faith. God, our soul tonight and drink yourself. Uh, help us to realize that what we enjoy most tonight in a relationship with Jesus Christ can come to a screeching halt because of our sin. So, Lord, speak into our life. And we just want to for Jesus' sake. Amen.